to control fusion power. How Tokamak research is paving the way for successful fusion energy reactors. Rachel McDermott, Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics. On the 9th of November 1989, I was eight years old and in elementary school. At the time, I didn't understand why the fall of the Berlin Wall was so important or what it meant. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here today to speak to all of you about my field, uh, the field of fusion energy research, and the progress that we have made towards making fusion energy a reality. Let's go to my title slide. In the last few years, the fusion community has developed some very innovative solutions to some of the most challenging problems science and engineering has ever had to face. And it's these solutions, or at least some of these solutions, that I will be presenting to you today. But first, I'd like to start by answering two questions that are key to appreciating this progress. First, what is fusion energy? And second, how do we actually propose to create it? Fusion energy is the energy of the sun and the stars. And it also has the potential to be a clean, competitive, and nearly unlimited source of energy on Earth as well. The sun is composed mainly of hydrogen atoms, which, due to the extreme temperatures, exist in a plasma state. This means that unlike in a gas, the electrons, the little blue guys, are stripped off of the atomic nuclei, and all of the particles are free to move about entirely independently of one another. Now, in a fusion plasma, the particles have a lot, a lot of energy, and sometimes when two nuclei collide, they can actually fuse together and form a new, slightly heavier element. This process, the combination of two light elements to form a slightly heavier element, is fusion. And in addition to just forming a new element, it also releases a significant amount of energy per reaction. This comes about because in fusion processes, the mass of the final product is actually always lighter than the mass of all of the things that came together to make it up. So a helium atom is actually lighter than the neutrons and the protons that came together. And the difference uh, in those masses is released as a net energy gain, according to Einstein's famous formula, e equals mc squared. Now, the most promising reaction for fusion on Earth is the DT reaction shown here, where the D stands for deuterium. This is heavy hydrogen. It's found in the Earth's oceans. It's comprised of one proton, and one neutron, opposed to hydrogen, which just has the one proton. And the T is for tritium. It's got two neutrons and one proton. And when these two come together, they form a helium atom, a neutron, and 17.6 MeV per reaction. Now, I know a lot of people don't go around thinking about energy in terms of mega electron volts. That's just something we do. But that's actually a lot of energy. If you compare the amount of energy you can get from two and a half grams of DT, that's about one spoonful if you were to condense it into a liquid form. It's the equivalent of 28 tons of coal, a factor of 11 million times more energy. Alternatively, you could compare it to oil, which is slightly more efficient than coal, but not really. Uh, and you get the same amount of energy in one spoonful of DT than 20 tons or 143 barrels of oil. It's a factor of 11 million times more efficient. So, how do we actually propose to create fusion energy on Earth? The sun is a giant, hot, burning ball of plasma. How do we create something that's millions of degrees on the Earth? Well, first off, it's millions of degrees, so you can't let it touch anything. So you need to find a way to confine a plasma without letting it come into contact with anything. And the way you do that is with a magnetic field. So in a tokamak, you have a magnetic field, and since the particles in the plasma are charged, they're bound to those magnetic field lines and forced to process around them. But in a tokamak, the magnetic field lines aren't straight like they are here. They're actually bent into a circle. And this means the particles are bound to those magnetic field lines and go round and around and around and around and can be trapped into a finite donut-shaped volume, and in this way presented from coming into contact with anything and melting whatever it touches. So 
This is actually something that we do every day. We have tokamaks, we can find plasmas. Once we have them, we heat them up to fusion-relevant temperatures to give the particles enough energy to fuse and to start creating uh, basically heat of their own and energy of their own. So, but the problem is, if you think of another energy source, if you think of a light bulb, you go to the hardware store, you buy a light bulb. You plug it in at home, you turn it on, and it does two things. One, it produces light. <laughs> Two, it gets hot. If you touch the glass, it'll be hot. Now, instead of a 50-watt light bulb, think of a 500-megawatt light bulb, so 10 million of these light bulbs. It's a lot of light. It's also a lot of heat, and that's our problem. We have a lot, a lot of heat. A tokamak is a little bit like a light bulb, except that a light bulb has the advantage that the light goes in all directions, and it uniformly distributes that heat. But a tokamak, has a directionality to it, and all of that heat gets thrown down here into this area at the bottom. So whatever material we put down there has to be able to withstand a very high heat load. Absolutely requirement. You can't let your tokamak melt. So the most obvious thing to do, the first step, is to create your tokamak, well, the walls of your tokamak, out of something that has a very high melting point. And this has been done, for example, at the Asdex upgrade tokamak that's here in Germany. This is a picture of Asdex here. And all of these tiles on the wall are made out of tungsten, which has a melting point of about 3,400 degrees. Now, that's pretty good. And for most everyday plasmas that we create at Asdex, it's enough, because the plasma is confined with a magnetic field. It doesn't actually touch the walls. The, the tungsten by itself can pretty much handle the heat. For example, if this plays, this is a discharge we ran just a few weeks ago. We had about 10 megawatts of power in this. I slowed it down a little bit so you can get a better feel for what these things look like. And in this discharge, everything went perfectly. Nothing melted, nothing sparked, everything was fine, which is why I'm showing it first, because this is not always the case. Occasionally, things get a little too hot. For example, in this discharge, we increased the amount of power we put into it. We went to 13 megawatts, opposed to the 10 that we did before. And here, when I play this, you'll actually see that the tiles up down here start to actually glow. This is tungsten that is getting so hot that it starts to glow, and glowing is one step before melting, and that's generally what we want to avoid. Or alternatively, in this discharge, when I play it, there was one tile along that wall that was not perfectly aligned with the other ones. It stuck out just a little bit. And you want your surfaces to be smooth. When something sticks out, it catches more heat than the ones around it. And in this discharge, that tile, it's going to be somewhere right in here. Oh, sorry, it's down there. Yeah. It actually got so much heat that the tungsten became molten and went flying everywhere, and that's the end of your plasma discharge. Not what you want if you're trying to make a steady-state reactor. So, this is the problem. Both of these plasmas were suffering from the same problem, and that is all of the heat we put in and all of the heat the plasma produces itself also has to flow out of that reactor at some point in time, and you can't let all of that heat get deposited locally anywhere. You need to distribute it evenly along all of the surfaces, around all of the walls. You need to control how much comes out, how quickly, and where it goes. So one of the ways that we have developed in the last few years of doing this, and this is the brand new research that has just really been proven to work, and we're all feeling much better about the chances of fusion now, um, is through radiative cooling. Now, when I say radiative, I'm not talking about radiation. I'm not talking about Madame Curie. I'm talking more like the radiators we have in our house that keep us warm in the winter. Actually, it's a lot like a light bulb that distributes the light in all directions, going back to that an analogy. So electrons are bound to atomic nuclei, and these electrons can bounce up and down in their atomic shells, and when they do that, they emit light in the form of photons, and that's an even distribution in all directions, which is exactly what we want. At which point in time, you might now be saying, wait a minute, Rachel, you told us earlier that in fusion plasmas, the electrons are stripped off of the nuclei. How can they bounce up and down? Well, that's true for hydrogen, which only has the one electron. But if you go to higher Z elements, like nitrogen with seven electrons or argon with 18, then they can retain their electrons even in a hot fusion plasma and have enough electrons to jump up and down and to distribute the light. So this is what we do. We inject argon and nitrogen into fusion plasmas, argon in the center and nitrogen down here at the bottom, in order to control how much we radiate light and how much energy is distributed. We actually monitor the temperature of the walls, and as the walls get hotter, we inject more gas. 
and that cools the walls, and we can keep the temperature of the walls where we want them. So this, for example, is done in this discharge, and I can show you it actually works. This has got 14 megawatts of cooling. I'm going to show identical discharges. The only difference is that this one has radiative cooling. We're puffing gas. And this one, we're not. And you can see for yourself what happens. This is a thermal image. So hot things show up as red, cold things as blue. And without the nitrogen, this diverter very clearly starts to glow. So this is a proof that what we're doing actually works. And actually, in this last campaign, just a few months ago, we put the maximum amount of power available on Aztec's upgrade, that was 23 megawatts, into the machine all at the same time, which we had never done before because it was a guaranteed way of melting the diverter. And this time, we did it with argon, and argon and nitrogen gas. Here's the traces of these two elements right here. We monitored the wall temperature. We had a set temperature, the black line, of this is where we want it to be. And then we measure the wall temperature, we adjust the gas that we puff into it to control the radiation, which I'm showing up here, and everything worked perfectly. Nothing started to glow. Everything was exactly where we wanted it to be, which is just a really, really nice thing to have in your hand when going to a next generation sort of device, the ability to control the steady state fluxes. Now, unfortunately, there is another problem. This is the steady state problem, and we have that solved. But there's a transient problem in a tokamak as well. And this comes about because if you look at the temperature or the pressure profile across the middle of the tokamak, it would look something like this, where you have a very steep gradient here at the edge. And that steep gradient is necessary because it allows you to get to very high temperatures in the core where the fusion is actually happening. But it's also a problem because, because if the pedestal gets too steep, it'll actually collapse. And when it collapses, it ejects plasma out of the confined region where we want it to be and into the walls where it can damage the walls, it can melt the walls, which is not what you want to have happen. Um, so this is a movie that I'll show in just a second of actual measured data. This is a measurement of the edge pedestal and how it behaves. Now, this, this instability, when this happens, when it reaches a critical gradient and ejects plasma, is called an ELM, or an edge localized mode. And when it does that, this is the power that'll hit the wall. So you'll see the gradient build, 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 It'll get too steep, it'll eject plasma, which hits the wall, and it'll happen, and we have it twice here in this film. So this is the temperature. It's building, 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 build. Oh, I missed the first elm, sorry. Building, building, building. It's going to hit the critical gradient here in just a second, and flattens. And all of the plasma that was in that area in between flies out. So we can also see this on fast cameras. We have lots of images of this sort of thing, so you can see it with your eye. You'll see the countdown coming down to zero, and that's when you'll see the plasma get expelled. There it is. That's the elm. You can see the plasma coming out. Now, in present-day devices, this is not that much of a problem because our plasmas are relatively small. So the amount of material that gets ejected is also relatively small. But in future devices, which will be much bigger, the amount of plasma that gets ejected will be much more. But the melting point of tungsten is not going to increase. It's going to stay exactly the same, which is why for future devices, it is absolutely imperative that we get rid of this instability. So how do we do that? Well, this has been a topic of ongoing research for a very long time. We've just started having success at this. What you do, if you remember I said the plasma consists of charged particles, we can find those particles with magnetic fields. So if we destroy the magnetic field at the edge just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit, then you can affect the confinement of the plasma just enough to stop that instability from happening. You can keep that pedestal from reaching the point where it suddenly has to collapse. And this is an example of how we do it. We, uh, in, I'm rushing now. Um, we have coils that we've installed outside the vacuum vessel of Aztec's upgrade, and we make we run current through those coils and create a magnetic field. And that magnetic field interacts with the tokamak magnetic field and can actually adjust it enough that the instability no longer occurs. So here's an example of this actually working in Aztec's upgrade. Here's the coil current at the bottom. This is the magnetic field that we're creating with these external coils that interacts with the tokamak field. And here, this is the power going to the tiles. Uh, each one of these spikes is an elm. And you can see when the coils are on, there are no more elms. So it works. With that, I'm going to go to my conclusion slide. <laughs> so in the last few years, the fusion energy community has been working very hard 
<laughs> to come up with solutions to the practical challenges of making fusion energy work. And I hope after this quick presentation, you'll agree we're having success at coming up with these solutions. We're actually having a lot of success. ITER will be the next step fusion reactor. It's being built right now in France, and it'll be the first device to show definitively that fusion energy can work. It'll demonstrate the feasibility of this by producing 500 megawatts of fusion power. Thank you very much.